I would now like to introduce our esteemed panel and the gurus of e-commerce themselves. So today we're joined by Peter Stoderdijk, which is the Chief Marketing and Technology Officer at Koala. Welcome, Peter. David Piska, the GM of Strategy and Innovation at Officeworks. Welcome, David. Thank you. And Joanne Hicks, the Head of Digital Marketplaces at Big W. Welcome, Joe. Hey, everyone. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on these guys. So first up, I'm going to be talking about Peter Stoderdijk. So Peter is an experienced marketer, renowned for building teams and taking companies from startup to growth company and beyond. He recently joined the Australian direct-to-consumer furniture and lifestyle brand Koala as their first global chief marketing officer. At Koala, Peter is responsible for brand marketing and sales, communications, technology, and digital development, and will be launching the brand globally over the next few years. Prior to joining Koala, he led the original series and brand marketing for Netflix in a broad global and strategic role. Peter got his start working with agencies such as Digitas, Deep Focus, and MXM, which is an Accenture Group company. Before transitioning to the brand side of uh, things as the CEO of social networking app Grindr, leading marketing analytics acquisition and content development. Peter was born and grew up in Des Moines in, in Iowa and has lived in both Chicago and Los Angeles. But right now he's living with, with us here in Australia in Sydney and his interior desi designer husband and their two dogs join him. So welcome, Peter. Next up, we have David. Uh, so David Peter, uh, David Pisker is the GM of Strategy and Innovation at Officeworks and has almost 20 years experience delivering customer focused solutions across a variety of industries, including retail, automotive, tourism, real estate, FMCG and wagering. After cutting his teeth at McKinsey & Co, David worked agency side running Tribal DDB, NetX and IE, as well as holding various senior management roles both locally and overseas. Welcome to the team, David. Thank you. And our third panelist today is Joanne Hicks. So Jo has been shopping online for over 20 years and loves the world of digital retail. Jo has been working in the digital space for more than 16 years and joined Big WX, which is Big W's digital team, in April this year as head of digital marketplaces. At Big WX, Jo is responsible for growing and trading marketplace channels both on and off bigw.com.au. Joe also leads data and reporting for Big WX. Now, prior to joining Big W, Joe was the Chief Operating Officer at Mabel.com.au, a startup company in the aged care and disability space, focusing on connecting people with support workers in their community. Joe has held various executive management positions for leading online companies, including eBay Australia, The Iconic, and Seek. Jo has a management consulting background also, uh, beginning her career with the Boston Consulting Group. Jo has an MBA from M uh, Melbourne Business School and completed a Bachelor of Commerce and a Bachelor of Arts at the University of Melbourne. Jo was born in Malaysia and moved to Australia in the late 80s, um, nice culture shock there, and uh, <laughs> she lives in Sydney with her husband. Uh, she's also a proud mum of two boys. And a fun fact for you, the last thing Jo actually bought online were some Marvel superhero fam jams for the entire family for Father's Day. Uh, of course, from bigw.com.au. So welcome, Jo. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. What an amazingly talented lineup we have for you today. I know you're all dying to actually hear from them. So I'm going to jump straight into questions and um, I wouldn't mind starting with you if that's okay, Joe. Sure. <laughs> Excellent. Now, you really did join Big W at um, a pretty crazy time, um, April 2020. So how has the global pandemic put a spotlight on the importance of on? It was certainly an interesting way to join a business um, in, in April, completely remote. Um, I think I so far have only met maybe five people in real life um, and it, it's certainly been an experience. I mean, I, look, I, I think Big W, just for context, has been in a bit of a turnaround journey for the last you know, several years. Um, and 
actually we in the last financial year reported our first profit in five years so we've really been in that turnaround journey and, and part of that um, has been uh, you know refocusing back on customers refocusing back on range um, and you know starting to invest a little bit in online but frankly you know a year ago it was still a very small part of the business I would say um, what COVID and the pandemic, I suppose, has done is really just accelerated that growth massively. Massive, you know, triple digit growth um, online suddenly become, became, you know, um, a huge spotlight. And way back in a April time, you know, we were doing scenarios where actually what would happen if um, big W stores were shut nationally? and we would be an online only business. Um, of, of course, that's happened in Victoria, in Melbourne. Um, and so we are truly, you know, online only in, in, in 22 of our Melbourne stores. Um, so it's really accelerated online. It's thrown in a, a spotlight in the importance of the online channel and it's allowed us to trade, to still meet customer needs, to, um, you know, trade our business uh, through the online channel. It's certainly um, also highlighted, um, you know, opportunities where we need to invest in online, in our capabilities, in our infrastructure and technology, and certainly has helped uh, get, you know, the, the C-suite to uh, back and support some of the things that we've wanted to do online. And so I suppose internally we've said it's really accelerated our plans, you know, what we were hoping to achieve in three years. We've been able to achieve in three months. Um, so certainly accelerating the growth and, and you know, we, we see that continuing to grow. Yeah, thanks, Joe. I think these um, contingency plans that businesses sort of dream up, those black swans where they don't really know what, you know, what the market could do or could possibly happen, but they look at worst case scenario, it's really come to light for a lot of retail businesses in particular. So it's great to see retail brands really adopt and adapt um, so rapidly. And I guess it opens up a bit of a, um, a gap in, you know, you can't just go purely online, right? You've got to think about the customer and all the different types of touch points that they have with you. So maybe for my next question, I might pose this to Peter. Peter, at Koala, your role really spans so many customer touch points. How do organisations like yours really prepare for this next frontier and, and fast track omni channels in particular to meet those customer demands? Yeah, so, uh, you know, what's interesting about the idea of omni-channel or multi-channel is, is that that definition is changing every day, right? And I think, you know, one of my, <laughs> I, somebody else said it, and I don't remember who it was, but the idea that for every one door that COVID has closed, like four or five have opened, um, because it has just forced us to accelerate certain plans, to change other plans, um, and, and moving towards an omni-channel strategy is really part of that for so many of our online businesses, right? So Koala is a great example of a business that has been mostly performance marketing driven, social heavy, very focused on the, the most efficient and most effective ways for us to uh, reach our consumers. Well, it turns out that if we were to broaden our aperture a little bit, if we were just to take a slightly wider view and start adding in additional channel opportunities, experiential, out of home, TV, et cetera, uh, there's so many more touch points available to us and, and ways for us to connect with our consumer. And all of them are still relevant during COVID. Um, differently, in some respects, out of home is a good example where, you know, with traffic down, you have to use out of home a little bit differently now as a marketer. But there are so many opportunities for us to connect with our consumers still during this time. And an omni-channel strategy, from my perspective, is really the only way to do that effectively. And how do you how do you go from a business where you haven't really thought about omni-channels at all to having a, an omni-channel mindset to really thinking about putting the customer at the heart of everything that you do? I see it from a customer journey perspective, right? So customers are not single faceted. So we as marketers cannot be either. Um, there is no one customer experience. There is no one customer journey. But if you're able to take a, a broader view, like I said before, and identify the various steps within a consumer journey, within um, their exposure to your brand, when could they be exposed? When are they currently exposed to your brand? What does it look like? If you can start asking some of those questions, it does, um, start to illuminate the path towards opening omni-channel for you. Amazing, thank you, Peter. Um, David, with your extensive background in strategy, what are the considerations brands should consciously be aware of when they're, they're thinking about their roadmap in a digital transformation sense? So when they're thinking about digital transformation strategies that they need to deploy, what are some of the things that they really need to give a lot of careful thought 
Um, that is a good question. Look, I think it all starts, and I'm going to sort of uh, repeat a little bit of, I think, what Peter and Joe have already said, is it all actually st starts with the customer and what the customer actually needs in your particular market. Um, uh, building, building from that, it then begins, you, you then need to ask yourself some sort of questions in terms of strategically what you're trying to achieve as a business and where your investments are. So, you know, I, I work in an every channel retailer. Um, uh, you know, we have a huge capital investment across 167 stores. 30% uh, of our, our trade pre-COVID was, um, was online. So we're relatively mature in the, in the Australian market. Um, so in terms of sort of the digital uh, sort of transformation that's going on at the moment, where, you know, if you want to call it, a, I, I think I heard from uh, a GM at uh, Australia Post sort of saying that um, the sort of flight to digital um, we'd seen about sort of a half a dozen years in terms of maturation occur during uh, over the last sort of three to sort of six months. So the things that, you know, we're thinking about um, are around the sort of scalability of our supply chain. Uh, you know, so one of the really positive things is we've been able to sort of scale for, for that demand. What does that look like going forward? Uh, what do the, sort of the new expectations of our customers look like uh, from a digital point of view? So click and collect is becoming more important and particularly contactless click and collect is something new in the Australian market. In the American market, that sort of curbside click and collect has, has been a feature, but something that hasn't really been popular in Australia. That's actually becoming, you know, standard. You know, how do we, how do we sort of, um, if you want to call it, you know, in, 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 in our market, how do we sort of ensure that we deliver a great service there, but sort of ensure that it is differentiated, that is part of the value add, rather than, you know, if you want to call it the the day-to-day the -day expectation. And then I think the sort of the, the final sort of component there is around how we use data. Um, and that's both data at the front end in terms of being able to give a far more personalized experience to our customers across every channel. And I think that's the, one of the real channel, uh, challenges that retailers were facing into pre-COVID but really needs to sort of accelerate going forward because we can offer a quite a personalized experience online, but in-store we're not so good at it. And we don't really take that data that we're using in-store uh, and make that personalized uh, uh, across all of our channels, whether that be online, through marketplaces or, or, or over apps. So how, how, do we, uh, how do we accelerate that going forward? And then uh, also using the data from a back end point of view. So being able to plan um, availability uh, or, or, and stock movement in a far more effective, cost effective way. So we can continue to deliver great service at the best prices in, in the market going forward. Mm -hmm. I'm really fascinated to get your view on, um, do you think there's any going back, right? Think about a retail consumer. Um, we've now been in lockdown for a long time. We've gotten used to buying online. Uh, we're starting to have a more personalised and more pleasurable or delightful experience. Uh, do you ever see a time where, say, six months or 12 months from now, everyone just goes back to normal? Um, or do you actually see that the market has dynamically or structurally changed and that the role of e-commerce is now just in a very different place. So keen to get the panel's view on that. Um, yeah, look, I, I, I definitely don't think we'll be going back to old normal. I, I think there'll definitely be a new normal. Uh, you, you know, uh, customers' sort of expectations uh, are changing, but customers also, you know, from all the research that we do, and we, you know, we, we've got a live panel of, of 500,000, uh, sorry, 500, 5,000 customers who we're constantly sort of in, in contact with. They're telling us that they really are missing sh uh, shopping, you know, in a, in a physical environment. But I, I definitely think the role of those physical environments, certainly for us, uh, will change, uh, you know, going forward. You know, you know we, we keep talking about sort of in-store experiences. You know, we, we as a, uh, as a retailer of technology, office supplies and furniture, you know, need to get more mature in that particular area to bring customers in, you know, into our ecosystem and really deliver, you know, greater value than simply showcasing our, our, our range because, you know, customers expect that online now. Um, uh, so it's, it's really about getting that balance between what occurs in store, what occurs online and how those two things work together.
And Joe, I could see you nodding quite a bit there. Um, I'm keen to know um, if you've seen anything really interesting like that, where a maybe an experience from another uh, company and you've gone, oh, that's good. I really like that. That's something that I could see really sticking and having a significant impact on consumers. Um, have you seen anything interesting out there? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I just wanted to build uh, on David's point um, because, I, you know, I was nodding because I think definitely agree and, you know, thinking through similar similar challenges. I think there's a little bit of parallel with actually how we're working in, in that um, we've all been used to working from home and um, to go back into the office needs to have a really good compelling reason or what's the job of going into the office to work. It's a similar thing with store. Um, with you know, for us, um, as David said, what's the balance? You know, our, our ambition is is to be a purpose-led digital retailer enabled by a great store network. So the store network, the job it does is around enabling some of the convenience elements, as David mentioned, around, you know, um, not just pick up in, in, on, in store, but drive up, you know, increasingly is very popular for us um, in terms of that direct to boot um, experience. Um, for for us, you know, we, we have quite a, a lot of regional stores, so it's still very much, um, the stores are very important to our communities um so you know definitely plays a, a, a role a role in there so you know i don't as it's you know as david said i don't think it will go back to how kind of how it was it's sort of um i think excitingly for us it's how how they will work together even better you know than previously and to that point around digital transformation one of the things that we're really mindful of and it's really helping us is how do you actually bring the entire organization end to end on that digital transformation because that's what will make it work around even very upfront working with our commercial team our planning team our buying team to consider online and to plan you know for that from the very start and we're not an afterthought around you know that as a channel so it really you know in that end to end so your question about um you know if i seen anything really cool um i think yeah, i'm seeing um actually lots of small businesses doing really interesting innovative of things actually one that came to mind when you said that was us shopping uh, online at an, an asian grocery online store um and the story there was um you know it's a it's a Asian grocery in Haymarket in Sydney, who've been supplying to restaurants as well as the public. And obviously when COVID happened, restaurants closed, they pivoted really quickly to build up, you know, a B2C site and started to trade online. Um, but cool little functionality. I actually was buying a few things added to my cart and, you know, the um, the experience came up to say, because I, I think I added like, um, I added like some spring onions and um, picking duck, because it's really cool. They're actually ordering from local restaurants around and, and bundling that together and I had a thing saying are you you know are you making picking duck you know here's five other things you'll need which was really cool because I could just go great yes I needed the wrapper and I needed the sauce and things like that so yeah really interesting little things that um, I think businesses are you know being innovative um, trialing things uh, listening to you know customers and and uh, that's exciting to see yeah that's fantastic I love that I um, I do have a few questions later in our discussion around personalization, which I'll tap into, um, and I wouldn't mind deep diving in that one. But before we do, I did want to engage our audience. Um, so we're just going to change gears slightly. Very, very shortly, guys, you're going to have a poll pop up in your screen. Um, and we really want to understand how you bought your last online purchase. So did you use a desktop computer? Did you use a mobile phone? Or did you use a tablet? Um, start answering uh, the poll and then um, Oh, good. Look at you go. Uh, I'm going to publish the results on the screen uh, very soon. We've got 60% of votes already in. It's a pretty easy question, right? So let's have a look at the results. Quick, get them in. Five, four, three. <laughs> Excellent. I'm going to end that polling now. All right, let's share the results. And it's actually a really interesting split, right? So 47% said a desktop computer, 46% said mobile, and 7% said tablet. Now, I think if you combine mobile phone and tablet together, it looks like devices, mobile devices wins, um, which is really interesting. We've seen this shift from desktop computer to mobile devices uh, over, over many years. Um, and I hope that's coming off your, your screen now because I'm going to jump back yep. into the palace. Awesome. Um, yeah, we've definitely seen that that shift and it's been occurring, you know, it's been a long trend over the last probably 15 years in Australia in particular and even longer in the US where the shift is going from desktop to mobile um, in terms of purchases. So 
Peter, I'm keen to get your thought, um, you know, with pe more people using mobile devices in some mm. shape or form to shop, uh, what are your tips to help optimize your e-commerce site for a mobile user? Yeah, so there's two points on the on the mobile use um, kind of in increasing. What's been really interesting through COVID, so since about March or so, um, really into April, we've actually seen an increase in desktop usage because people are stuck at home, right? And so their inclination to use uh, their mobile devices for things like purchasing or scrolling the internet in one way or another um, has actually shifted a little bit. It's not a huge shift. It's more in the like 15 to 20% or so, um, but we've seen a shift nonetheless and and truly i believe it's because people are spending more time at home i think that's one of the trends um, that will probably revert as we go back to whatever the new normal is um, that we will continue to see uh, you know an overwhelming increase towards mobile and i think one of the key things for me is simplicity in the mobile experience right so one of the challenges we all have um, as e-commerce marketers as e-commerce experts in one way or another is there's so much information we want to convey in one screen or in one experience but we have to do it in the most simplistic way possible because a crowded screen means a lost sale. Um, a convoluted checkout process means a lost sale. A, an overwhelming visual experience means they're moving away and they're not coming back. Um, and so the, the key for me is, especially from a mobile perspective, is to keep it as simple as possible. Um, really prioritize the amount of information that you need on that initial screen before the scroll um, and, and take a, a really hard look at what is really crucial and then test and learn as much as you possibly can to make sure you've got the right experience for your consumers. Yeah, thank you, Peter. And um, David, did you have something to add? To yeah, that? Uh, look, I, I just wanted to add, I, I guess, because, uh, you know, we're, we're all sort of focusing on sort of trends during the, during the disruption of, of COVID. Um, and, you know, interestingly, because, you know, Victoria is in lockdown, whereas the rest of the, the, the nation is is in a, a, you know, sort of a, a slightly more liberated uh, 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 form of existence. Uh, a couple of the sort of trends that we've noticed is absolutely in, in Victoria, we've seen a, a, a small increase in desktop usage. But during the disruption of COVID, we saw a huge flight to mobile. And interestingly, uh, the things that drove people to walk towards mo mobile was really about confidence in their online shopping. Uh, or, or sorry, I shouldn't say online shopping, in their shopping in total. What we saw is we saw uh, triple, if not uh, quadruple digit increases in functionality such as stock alerts and check stock in a nearby store, mm -hmm. that type of stuff. Because the importance of making sure that that trip you made to a store was going to result in what you what you desired to buy was far more important or became far more important to customers. Um, now, you know, will that become a, you know, like as we move out of COVID, will that be as important? Probably not, but it's certainly the expectations in terms of customers, um, I'm sorry, rather the change in customer expectations around, you know, um, uh, stock availability, stock accuracy, um, uh, the, the, the usage of their time is going to be far more important in, in, in the uh, coming years. Instant gratification matters more now than it ever did from an e-commerce perspective. Absolutely. Do you think that uh, the fact that people are spending more time researching will, will change their behaviour just or their thoughts about the value of online purchases? So a lot of people are usually quite interested in a tactile experience, but by spending so much time researching, identifying, and they've got different sets of um, it, things that are important to them when they're going through their purchase now, do you think that'll have a significant impact on the way that they will buy into the future as well? Go for it, Joe. <laughs> Joe, do you want to go? Um, well, I can talk, I can suppose talk from our experience. Um, I think that's a really interesting point, Narelle. I mean, there's always been categories that um, we talk about, you know, sort of people prefer that more tactile experience, you know, furniture is one of those that comes to mind. Um, actually, even even in toys, McW is very strong in toys, um, you know, but we have a lot of customer feedback around wanting to us to have more 
better content around showing the unopen opening of a toy, for example, so you could get a sense of how it works, the size and the scale. And that's in that category uh, enough to kind of give you some comfort around that. But there are categories where, um, you know, people do prefer, um, you know, physically to shop. Um, when I was working at, at the Iconic, you know, obviously apparel um, is one of those ones, you know, so the way we had to overcome that was really about needing to find ways where you give customers the confidence um, uh, around shopping for apparel online. So, you know, technology, uh, enabling things like as accurate a sizing as you can um, and, and operationally allowing um, fast free returns um, you know think things like that I suppose to kind of look at how online could, could work for those categories it'd be interesting to understand um, I suppose outside of COVID you know I mean how shopping behavior might change I and mean, we, we still are selling a lot of apparel and furniture online um you know more than you know before um so customers are are sort of you know it seems to be they're quite comfortable you know it should do that so um yeah i'm not sure peter i mean you're in a really interesting area in terms of having you know bedding is one of those things you you would have thought that you needed to go in store and jump on the bed and, and you know and try before you buy but uh, yeah you know you guys have proven that that is not the case yeah, and I think, you know, one of the, the bigger benefits for us from a COVID perspective is that a lot of the folks who were not previously comfortable buying furniture or a mattress online have sort of been forced to try it out, um, to, to figure it out, and then realize that it's not the big bad evil that they thought maybe it was, um, that it's okay to experience a 120 night trial versus um, having to see it in the store or sit on it or you know touch it or feel it in some way. Um, I think it, it's sort of disproven a lot of myths around e-commerce, this, this kind of forced experience um, into e-commerce. And, and I'm, I'm really happy about that. That being said, there will all, I firmly believe there will always be a place for brick and mortar. Order, there will always be a place for a store experience because that tactile in-person sales experience has a lot of value. Um, it, it just doesn't have to be the only way uh, that people shop. And I think that's what this is continuing to prove to us. I said it before, consumers are not single faceted um, and certainly their buying behaviors are not single faceted either. Um, so we're always going to see multivariates inside how people shop and purchase uh, their various items in their homes and, uh, and goods and services. Yeah, ab absolutely. I j just sort of like building on, on that, I think one of the sort of interesting trends that again, we're sort of seeing accelerated through the disruption we're going through is, is being able sort of to cater to different, um, you know, parts of, of the, the, the purchasing journey that w once upon a time you may, may have thought was, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the realm of the store or, or the, the purpose of the store. So, if, you know, so for instance, sort of uh, choose, you know, understanding and choosing and sampling a product. I think, uh, you know, a, a lot of customers once upon a time thought that was the realm of a sort of bricks and mortar or the strength mm. of a bricks and mortar store. What of course we've been able to do over the last couple of years and is only accelerating is helping sort of under, uh, understand those use states of those customers. So helping them being able to choose the right ergonomic chair for them in an online environment. Um, helping them actually be able to sort of design their own sort of solutions in an online environment, which, you know, three or four years ago, I think most customers would have felt, or certainly most retailers would have felt was the, the, the domain of a, of, of a physical store. But then on the other hand, some of the things that we're, we're, we're looking at is, you know, what are the things that, you know, occur in an online environment that we want to bring into that in-store environment? So, you know, we know that ratings and reviews are really, really important for our customers. And we know that we can convert so much better if that we have that third party in endorsement of another consumer so how do we bring that into our physical stores whether that actually be physical or through a, a, an augmented reality um, experience through you know uh, the the office works app for, for, for instance so th those types of of that type of thinking and those types of experiences are only beginning to sort of accelerate during this time and those who can do it it better than their competitors are the ones who are, are going to stand a better chance of, of, of winning. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, David. I think that whole, what can we learn from this experience and how do we bring it into the holistic customer life cycle um, and where they go when they want to go there is going to be critical to the success moving forward. Um, I'm going to launch another uh, This time it's about competition 
And uh, I'm going to pose a question to Joe in a second, but uh, the questions around where do you shop? Uh, do you shop in for as, with Australian retailers only? Do you go with mostly international retailers? Um, or you just don't shop online much at all? So um, I'd really love to know what you're doing. Um, and I've got my own view on this, so I might give you my two cents as well. But Joe, while we're waiting for everyone to respond, um, you know, the online retailing space, you know, whilst it opens up borders for us to sell to international shoppers, it also opens up a lot of competition, right? So um, how do you see Australian businesses really faring on that international landscape? That's a good question. Um, I, I suppose, you know, it's, 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 it's been a topic in the retail space for many, many, many years, right? Um, you see, it's not just online. We saw the conversation happen, you know, when, um, big, you know, in bricks and mortar, when brands like Zara and H&M came into the market. And, you know, I think it's one of those questions. I, I mean, um, and, you know, I'd love to hear the others as well. Um, I think it's, it's an element of actually helping us raise our game and pushing us, you know, um, in Australia a little bit harder around, you know, needing to improve our experience for customers. Um, certainly helping raise the bar uh, around customer expectations, you know, um, around across every element from the user experience to convenience type areas like shipping time and delivery returns processes, um, payment options. Uh, so I think really, um, you know, accelerating that innovation, um, needing to kind of make sure that we are meeting, you know, customer needs uh, around that. Um, in terms of, I suppose, flipping around the other way, um, certainly when, you know, when I was at eBay, it was certainly looked at uh, as a way for Australian businesses to also launch and go um, internationally uh, around uh, how we can also look at the, the market outside of Australia um, to for brands and businesses to also grow um, and expand uh, internationally as well. So I think, yeah, it goes a little bit both ways. All right, I'm going to share the results. So majority of people are buying locally. Um, and I wasn't surprised by that result only because, gosh, it takes so darn long if you order anything from overseas at the moment. So um, my little boy has ordered some uh, LED lights to set up his room as a gaming room. And I tell you what, he's been waiting for six weeks. And every time we have a parcel to the front door, he almost breaks into tears. Um, <laughs> so shopping local definitely has its benefits. Thank you, Joe. Um, I know that we're coming close to towards the end and I still have a few more questions um, before I open up to audience questions. So um, maybe I'll make this one my last one. Um, my last question is, oh, which one should I choose? Maybe uh, I'll, I'll go with personalization because I know you brought this up before, um, Peter, and I'd be really interested to just get you to talk on the topic of personalization. How's it, you know, it's come such a long way from simply just addressing um, someone by their name in an email, you know, people are really expecting that filtered messaging based on their browsing history um, and making it a truly interactive customer experience. So um, what are the, some exciting innovations that you've seen or are deploying in this space at the moment? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I've seen that I, I continue to sort of be fascinated about how um, how it can continue to be executed well, at, like how long the technology can last, um, is the idea of personalization in your e-commerce experience. So never mind the CRM and the social experience and the tailored personalization within content, but specifically the shopping experience you are being provided on a website because of cookie caching, because of um, whatever data we're able to collect or whatever you opt into. Um, it's not something that a lot of retailers are doing today, but I do find it pretty fascinating. Um, one basic application is if you're in a 25 product uh, retailer, right? So that you've only got 25 products. If you've already bought five of them, it doesn't make sense for me to continue serving up those five products to you as my hero products. I should be serving up new products to you as hero products so that you can continue to engage in the brand um, every time you visit our website, so on and so forth. It's not a perfect technology because there's an end to that, right? So what do you do when you uh, kind of reach the limit of your experience and, and can't continue to personalize. So that's one of my questions or kind of curiosities around it, but I'm very intrigued by the idea of it. And I think it will continue to change and shape the way that we provide a personalized e-commerce experience, even outside of marketing, advertising, and CRM. Yeah, look, I actually think personalization is, um, is one of those territories 
that uh, if you, again, it's not about nailing it because like we're an, ev we're an evolving uh, species. Sure. Um, but like, you know, if you can uh, get ahead of the field, then, um, uh, you know, then you, you really drive competitive advantage. Now, the, 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 I guess the areas that we're focusing and we're a little bit different to, to, to Peter because we're an every channel re retailer, uh, it, it's probably two things. Is, is one around personalization around a life cycle. So, you know, we, uh, and I'll, we, you know, we, we service a, a lot of different sort of uh, uh, customer segments, but I'll, I'll focus in on, on parents. Uh, over the last couple of years, uh, you know, we've begun to sort of focus in on those customers who shop with us during back to school. And being able to collect data so that if little Jimmy uh, is shopped for for the first time and he's in year four, we actually know not only that next year he's more than likely going to be in year five. Um, and we know his address, so we know whether he has or he hasn't moved. So we know likely what school he's going to and what the needs are. And in Australia, you know, because uh, states are also quite different, there's some nuances around that. So we can actually get really quite um, personalized and quite nuanced um, and really actually sort of celebrate the progression of a particular child or family's sort of education journey. It's really the, the personalization across the life cycle, which is really, really powerful. Then I think the other really key thing is, is about being able to draw, and I mentioned it before, both our offline data and our online data together. That's, that's really powerful. But then if you begin to match that with a whole bunch of external data like, um, uh, you know, things as terms uh, uh, as simple as weather, your ability to be able to personalize uh, uh, a, a customer's journey through your ecosystem becomes so much more stronger. Um, and, you know, this, and I'm sure we're not the only ones, this, this is a huge area of investment for, for, for Officeworks um, and, and will continue to be, you know, on an ongoing basis. So, you know, personalization, I, I think is gonna be, you know, if you think about from, a, from an online point of view, um, price, uh, supply chain and delivery, you know, ha has been the, if you want to call it the, the territory for, for, for competition, uh, you know, the, or the major territory for competition in, in the past decade. I think data and personalization is really the, that territory for the next decade. Yeah, thank you both. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. And I mean, whilst we've been using a lot of big data and data analytics to be able to understand our customers better, it's how do you actually deploy it into some form of content or communication or story that can, um, it's not just a one-off, bam, and we're done, but how does it narrate over a series of purchases or years or life cycles? So um, that customer life cycle becomes more and more integral into that marketing campaign. Um, all right, I'm gonna throw to some audience questions with two minutes to go. So. Um, Thumbs up or thumbs down, um, would you say opening a bricks and mortar store at this point in time, I would say in Australia somewhere, um, uh, saying the next six odd to eight odd months would be a good decision or a bad decision? Would you open somewhere yourself in the next six to eight months, bricks and mortar? Good. Or oh, unsure. <laughs> okay, Dave, quickly, why good? Uh, why? Because uh, I think you've got an opportunity to rethink your property strategy with all the disruption that, that's occurred. And I think there's certain parts of Australia where, you, you, again, depending on your business, uh, where you'll uh, actually stand to gain. So I wouldn't be opening up necessarily in the CBD, uh, but there are other parts of, of, of metro and regional Australia that I think will actually uh, drive a dividend for you. Great, thank you. Um, any tips from the panel on how do we man maintain this wonderful momentum that we've got? E-commerce is booming, how do we keep it going? Build a long-term relationship with your consumer. Offer, continue to offer convenience options uh, that works with consumer. Continue to understand what your customers really, really want and deliver to that. Fantastic. Heart of the consumer, really important. If you're adding value, you'll continue buying. All right. Do you expect growth in online trade to grow after the pandemic situation cools down? Specifically for Joe, that one. <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, interesting, I was just reading an article in the Australian this morning about Australian retail as a whole online being estimated to be about 25% you know, odd um, 
as a general um, over the next 18 months to two years. Obviously, some in some sectors and categories have been a lot higher. Um, you know, perhaps it might not be as crazy growth. Um, we're talking a little bit about next year and how, how we're going to overlap COVID. Um, but certainly, I think, you know, we hope and, you know, we're um, planning on that, on that growth. And then final question, social media based. Um, where, what are the social media strategies um, that you think would work really well with engagement to complement, say, your e-commerce or your website? Uh, I, I'll, I'll jump in there on that one. Um, you know, for, for Koala, it is specifically around um, design and value content. Um, so it, it's the idea, everything that we're doing on social should be building on what our furniture is providing from a direct product perspective, right? So it's building on aesthetics, it's um, providing people the tools and, and information that they need. Um, it's also celebrating uh, the design aesthetic of our consumers, et cetera. So it's definitely a two-way street. So user-generated content is what you're looking at? Mm, okay. uh, partly, yes. I think for us, we're also looking at how we better engage with some communities that are online. You know, we have really, really passionate communities that are, you know, in different groups. Um, and so how do we better, um, uh, yeah, engage and, and better use social media as a channel on not just your traditional marketing stuff, but also things like customer service um, and, you know, loyalty engagement, uh, those uh, other elements um, that social media, you know, where customers um, are there and then talking, you know, to us and about us. Yeah, we, we, we're quite traditional when it comes to sort of social media. We, we, we see it as, as two things. There's one, uh, to Joe's point, uh, uh, very much around a sort of a, a service channel. Um, and then the, the second component is that brand community in, engagement channel. Um, you know, again, you know, because of the nature of our business, we we wouldn't be a, a, as advanced uh, or as exciting, I guess, as, as what Peter uh, would have experienced in the past and would be experiencing with with uh, with the koala brand. Wow, okay, that was a fast and furious 45 minutes. Massive, massive thank you to all of our panellists, Joe, Peter, David, thank you so much for your time. I'm sure we could have spent half a day doing this session, but um, look, we have recorded the session. We will share it out with everyone who has attended. Please push it out to your network, send it out to people who might have missed today's session. Um, we would love to stay in touch with you, of course, on all of the socials. So check us out on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Insta, anywhere you can find us, we'll be there. And uh, if you're specifically interested in any of our e-commerce courses or education areas, then um, jump on to online.rmit.edu.au and you can find it all there. But stay safe, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us on the couch today. Thank you.